Hi everyone, I'm Linda Reed Annabelle and welcome back to another Business, Business, Business Skills webinar. We're actually rounding out our last couple of skills webinars for the week. We have three more to go for 2019 until we take a break for two th and come back, oh, sorry, for 2018, before we take a break and come back in 2019 in February with our new skills webinars. Today we are talking with Cameron Marsden from Bulletproof My Business and we're talking about a topic that is majorly important to all business owners and that is actually how to make debt your friend within business and how to have a healthy debt within your business or debt proof your business wouldn't that be great you know that we can make sure that debt isn't a problem for us within business now I know as a business owner myself I've been there I've done that I've had that invoice that you know isn't going to get paid or is going to likely be one of those huge ones to get paid so do come and join us for the conversation this is not a comp topic that we should feel guilty about this is a topic as business owners we should be going yay we are proactive in taking action on making sure that we do the right things for our business now Cameron I'm going to give the heads up is unfortunately vision impaired today and has just moved house he's joining us and I would like to say thank you for doing that and thank you for making it so between the two of us we should have fun today on this webinar um, and I'm gonna hand over Cameron now to let you know a little bit about him and what we'll be covering today thanks a lot Linda and great to be here thanks for having me you're welcome I, I just want to say just as a bit of a preface this you're right this is a bit of a taboo subject for a lot of us in business but the fact of the matter is any business that sells on terms has faced this problem before. You have had an invoice that hasn't been paid or worse has been paid just whenever your customer feels like it. And yep. really what we're going to talk about today is the ideal credit process. And in other words, getting control of that back, making sure that you are the one in control of when you get paid. And bottom line, we want to help you get paid on time and in full. And Cameron, I think something we don't forget, we forget in business and especially when you're starting is not anyone to everyone's had an accounts background. That's but right. Not everyone knows what a credit process should be. And you go into business as a business owner, trusting everyone. Yeah, yeah. they're going to hire me. They're going to pay me. It's all great. <laughs> and that, that's exactly right. And that's a very good point. The, the fact of the matter is, because most of us are trustworthy, we assume that everyone that we deal with is also trustworthy. And when it comes to, excuse me, when it comes to issuing credit and just trusting that they're going to pay, gone are the days where a handshake is enough. You know, a person's word is no longer their bond. A person's word means absolutely nothing. And that's why today we're going to go over what the ideal credit process is, what the steps are that you really should be taking as you're going through issuing credit. And some of this, if you've never seen a credit process before, a lot of this is going to be quite eye-opening. Yeah. Um, and also, if you're familiar with the credit process, if you have an established credit process, you may pick up a tip or two, tip or two along the way. And who knows, you may find out that you're actually doing everything in this process. And if that's the case, yeah. fantastic. You're probably getting paid on time. <laughs> That is the dream of all service-based businesses. It is, Definitely. It? Yeah. Okay. So, guys, I'm going to leave you in Cameron's hands. You will see me. We're just going to pop off camera for a moment now So, because Cameron's got a presentation that needs the whole screen this morning. So, I'm going to turn Cameron and I off camera. And, Cam if Cameron, can you start sharing your screen? I can. There we go. And let's see if I can <coughs> camera. Here we go. I used to be able to. There we are. Yeah. Hide them. There we go. There we go. We're off camera. Fantastic. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is the ideal credit process and really what that means for your business. And obviously Bulletproof My Business is what I run. Yeah. So a little bit about me first. First and foremost, I'm a father, you know, my children, my family and my world. And I know that a lot of us here on business, business, business are exactly the same. You know, a very big reason that we're in business is to support our family and to make sure that we can provide them with the lifestyle and the comforts that we want them to experience, which is, I guess, why this is such an important subject and something that we want to make less taboo and something that we can just talk about openly because it's a problem that we can fix. You know, I've always had a fascination with technology making life easier and the way that we can interact with technology to make things that otherwise would have been a manual, difficult process quite easy, especially if they're repetitive. I actually used to have a quite successful printing business in Sydney going back quite a few years now. <laughs> and I was a young single dad. I was in my early twenties making some very good money in this business. And then I got a bit of a wake up call. I actually lost over $160,000 because two of my clients who were actually linked together went into liquidation and it meant that I didn't get paid, you know, out of the $180,000 that I was owed at the time, I saw 20. Now, 
at the time, as you can imagine, for anyone who's been through that, I was devastated. This almost broke me. But the reality is I was actually very lucky because it did two things for me. One, it taught me or it made me go out and learn everything there was to know about liquidation and that process and to how to prevent it from being a problem. And second of all, I was actually very lucky I didn't experience a clawback, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Now, I ended up creating a service to stop businesses from losing money. I created a service and a business to stop this from being a problem for everyone and really take that process that up until now has been manual and tedious and quite often just put off because it's too hard and made it so easy that there's no longer an excuse for not going through with it. Now, a little about Bulletproof. I launched Bulletproof back in 2013, so it's about five and a half years old now. We are Australia's only debt preventer. Okay, just to clarify, we are not debt collectors. We don't have anything to do with debt collectors. We give, we put the process in place before it becomes a problem so that if you do need a debt collector, we make them much more effective. Yep. Having said that, by following this process, it really, ha- it really will make a big difference. And in fact, since I launched Bulletproof in, in 2013, we've never lost a single cent for any of our clients running through this process. Ah, it's it's that effective. Yep. Now, we've overhauled the credit process to make it really easy. And because of that, the steps that normally would get skipped because they are quite difficult or time consuming, we've automated them to a level that there's no excuse anymore. The entire credit process can be completed in under 60 seconds. Wow. That's pretty impressive because we need business time. We need time, guys, don't we? And 60 seconds really is something that you can afford to spend. Absolutely. And we find that a lot of the time by going through this ideal credit process, you eliminate a lot of the problems before they actually become one. Yep. We're going to talk about that in more detail as well. <clears throat> a high level overview of the ideal credit process. There are really five steps to it. You have identification, knowing who your customer is, your terms, which refers to your terms of trade, your fine print. So knowing what it is that you're actually having, your, sorry, setting out your rules and what you'll accept and what you won't. <clears throat> Doing your due diligence on a customer. This is a step that quite often gets skipped entirely. Setting the credit terms. So in other words, defining when you expect to get paid and how much you're going to lend your customer. And yes, I said lend. And finally, registration. And that's the process of becoming a secured creditor. Now we're going to talk about each of these in more detail. That's a high level overview of what we're going to be covering today. The reason that this is so important, the reason the credit process is so important is because when you are selling to another business on credit terms, you are lending them money. Now, I just want to take a moment to go over that just one more time. When you are issuing credit from your business to another business and your terms might be seven days, 30 days, whatever it might be, you are lending that other business money because if they don't pay you, you have still got to pay out all the money in between and you need to have a formal process to make sure that you're covered for that. Because if you are selling on terms and you're not actually following the steps that we have laid out here, you're gambling. It's that simple. You're not running a business, you're gambling. (laughs) Now, if you have not been paid before, if you've gone through this and you've got invoices that haven't been paid, what we're going to do today is we're going to try and work out which of the credit process steps have actually been skipped. As we go through each step, you're probably going to have an aha moment. You're going to look at that and go, Oh, That's what I didn't do that time. Now, I want to emphasize, I'm not blaming you for not being paid, okay? At the end of the day, not knowing something is not your fault. That's what we're here to rectify. But if you follow these steps, if you actually do this work properly before you get excited and make a sale and send an invoice, you will get paid. Now, to put this into perspective, you couldn't go to a bank and expect to get a loan without filling out any paperwork, without following the proper processes. And in fact... Linda, if you can indulge me, we're going to just, we're going to put a little bit of an impromptu play here. Okay. You're running a business. Okay. And I'm going to come to you as a potential customer. Yep. I'm knocking on your door right now. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. Hi. Hi. um, Listen, you don't know me, but I want to buy stuff from you and I'd like to do that on an account. Now I'm not going to fill in any paperwork, but I've got two mobile numbers of other guys who say that I'm going to pay my bills and I'd like to get... $20,000 $20,000 on 30 days terms. Is that okay? No. What, what do you mean no? 
what do I mean? No. Oh, well, you know, the reality of it is we do need to make sure that we've got the processes in place. You're talking for a troubleshooter here, Cameron, who spent years getting businesses <laughs> back <laughs> from those agreements. <laughs> and as silly as that sounds, that is what a lot of us in business are doing every single day. We right, get excited yep. about someone coming to us. We've made a sale. We're looking at the prospect of getting that profit, doing that job, providing that service. And we get a little bit excited and we jump ahead a few steps and we skip a few of the critical things that really need to happen every time. And as a result, we lose money because not everyone who comes to you has a good intention. Not everyone who comes to you can afford your service. That doesn't mean that they don't want it. It means that they may not be able to afford it at the time. And that's a pretty big problem because yep. you're relying on their honesty to get paid. Now, the way that you, basically what this comes down to is you've worked hard to build your business. You deserve to get paid on time and in full. It's unfair that you should have to wait at your customer's mercy. It's unfair that you should not get paid at all under any circumstances. That's what we're going to address today. <clears throat> so getting right into it, the first stage of the credit process is identification. You need to know things like who is your customer? What type of structure do they use? What, is their ABN active? Where are they based? Are they registered for GST? Now, the reason that these are so important is because if you don't know who your customer is, you cannot go to the next stage, which is terms, because you can't form a proper contract without actually knowing who it is that's signing the contract. No. Knowing the type of structure is also important because that could dictate to you how you actually go forward and what sort of credit you're comfortable issuing. Whether the ABN is active or not, look, that's self-explanatory. And it's a step that quite often we skip. If the ABN of the business that we're dealing with is not active, they're not actually in business. You cannot issue credit to them because you're not going to get paid. Basically, you know, it could be an accident, but it's unlikely. The reality mm. is these, to check all of these, to go through and um, check these manually at the moment, what you would do is you'd go to the Australian Business Register and have a look at the information there. Unfortunately, the Australian Business Register is woefully out of date, okay? So it means that you cannot rely on just the ABR to do your checks. You also need to go through to ASIC and check the details that they've got as well. Because at last check, and last check was this morning at about 9.30, there were around 26,500 companies that were on the ABR showing as active and ready to go, but were on ASIC as deregistered. Oh my gosh. 26,500 companies. Now, if you rely on just the ABR to go through and do your checks, you could be missing that information, which means that you could be effectively issuing credit to an entity that is not actually credit worthy. These are things that you've got to be aware of as you're going through. <clears throat> The reason it's important to know where a company is based or where a business is based is because in your preliminary sales talk, when you're actually talking to them, they might tell you where they're from. They might say, hey, I'm based in Sydney. But when you look at the company that you think is them, it has a postcode and an address in Western Australia. Now, yep. that could be an innocent mistake or it could be that you're actually not dealing with the correct entity. So these are things that you need to be aware of as you're going to issue credit to them because the more information you have, the safer you're going to be and the more effective the rest of the process will be. Now, the reason it's important to know if they're registered for GST or not is because GST registration typically tells you that they are turning over more than $75,000 a year. Now, that's not always the case. You can register for GST if you turn over less, but generally speaking, if they've registered for GST, they're turning over more than $75,000 a year. It's a good preliminary check to know. And obviously, if you've got someone who's coming to you and applying for $50,000 credit or $20,000 credit, and they're not GST registered, you know for a fact their turnover must be less than $75,000 a year. Yeah. Now, if someone's coming to you applying for $20,000 and they're only turning over less than $70,000, that seems pretty risky. They're basically relying on you to be the bank to help build their business. <clears throat> so that, that's why identification is so important. Once you know who your customer is and you've got that information, then you can move forward to the next step, which is the terms, referring to terms of trade. Now, I wanna take a moment to have a little chat about something we call Franken terms. Now, this is a term, this is a, a, a phrase that we've actually coined ourselves. Basically what that means is you've built your terms of trade yourself. You've gone mm -hmm. off and gotten bits and pieces from other agreements. You've put them together. You've mished them up, mashed them up together. You've changed the titles, changed the dates, put your company name on it, and hey, presto, you've got your own terms of trade. <laughs> Problem with that is you're not a lawyer. Now, if you are a lawyer yeah. watching this, then obviously disregard that last statement. <laughs> for the most part, you're not a lawyer. You need to have the proper representation to do this. And all too often, and it's, 
quite a shame, but all too often we see people using American terms of trade. They're using legislation that doesn't even exist in this country, referring to it and hoping that that will offer them protection. It's an unfortunate side effect of a global economy. People yep. just assume that the terms of trade, if they're good for that company, they're good for this company, they change the name out and they think that they're protected. The reality is so vastly different. If this is you and you're relying on a Franken terms, you need to get advice immediately. Okay, it's not going to protect you. You may get lucky and you might get some terms through, but the problem is if you have taken bits and pieces of terms and put them together, if you've got a term that's either out of date or out of jurisdiction or even from an entirely different country, it could invalidate your entire contract. Yeah. And that's a pretty big problem. You want to make sure that these are here to protect you. All too often, the terms of trades are actually skipped. You know, it's a step that has to be done at the right time in the right way for them to be effective. Your terms of trade are your rules. It's what you expect your customer to abide by when dealing with you. And that's that part of the process where you're lending them money. You need to make sure that you've got a contract in place to protect you. Because if you don't, then there are no rules. They can pretty much do what they want. Now, the reason that it's so important when and how they're delivered is because terms of trade are only legally binding if they are agreed to at the point of incurring the debt. Yeah. Okay. Now, to put that into perspective, a lot of people come to us and say, hey, we've got our terms of trade on our invoice. It says seven days. People aren't paying at seven days. They don't actually have to. It doesn't matter what you put on your invoice. It's too late. Okay, your terms of trade need to be agreed to before the invoice is even generated. So if you do a quote, your terms of trade should be on your quote. If you don't do quotes, you need to have your terms of trade ready to be signed off on at the point that you're ready to deal with them before you raise the invoice. Because anything you put on your invoice is practically irrelevant. Apart from the dollar amount, the terms that are on there are not actually something that have to be adhered to because they haven't agreed to them at the point of incurring the debt. <clears throat> And that leads me to another point. You know, I've seen a lot of posts on different groups talking about verbal agreements. There is absolutely no such thing as a verbal agreement. You know, as the old adage goes, a verbal agreement is only as good as the piece of paper it's written on. Mm -hmm. And that's so true. The fact of the matter is, whatever has been said between two people cannot be proven and therefore does not exist. Terms of trade have to be agreed to at the point of incurring the debt in writing. Okay, they have to be signed off at the right point in time. And they can be a greater source of protection if they're done correctly. Your contract can be your strength. Yeah. Or they can leave you incredibly vulnerable if they're not. And there's a huge distance in between those two things. Now, your terms of trade need to define things like when you expect to get paid, what happens if they don't pay you, um, how, you'll, how you'll resolve disputes, warranty, um, intellectual property, risk, all sorts of things that need to be covered by your terms of trade. Obviously, this is going to vary from industry to industry, but for your industry, for the business that you're running right now, the key things that you need to be protected from and against need to be in your terms of trade. Now, if you're not confident that your terms of trade actually covers all of this, then it's worth, worth getting a review done to see if that is the case, either through Bulletproof or have a chat with your solicitor. There are plenty of different ways of doing it, but being complacent is not an option. The other thing that you've got to be aware of in terms of trade is that having a static document that you had drawn up by a lawyer 10 years ago is not going to help you. The law changes all the time. And as a result, you need to have your terms of trade updated all the time. <clears throat> to give you an example, only last year, there was a change that went through called the Unfair Contract Terms Act. Now, this changes the validity of a lot of existing agreements when they're re-signed, which means that if you're not aware of that and your terms of trade have got what are considered unfair terms, those terms could be removed from the overall contract, which could in fact leave you vulnerable. At the same time, you know, it's all too common to have a look at older terms of trade or Franken terms and see references to things like the Trade Practices Act of 1979. <laughs> Just to put into perspective, was superseded by the, the um, Competition and Consumer Act of 2010. Yes. Basically, that means that if those terms of trade haven't been updated in a timely manner, they could be so woefully out of date that they're doing nothing to protect you. You might as well just shake their hands and take the gamble. That's a pretty big problem. And obviously, your business is worth more than that. We want to make sure that you're protected. So take your terms of trade seriously. Don't consider them a static document. They have to evolve over time with your business. And that's the final point to make on this. As your business grows and changes, your requirements will also grow and change. It could be that when you first started, you created a terms of trade or you bought a terms of trade from a lawyer or whatever it might be. 
And at the time, it suited your business perfectly. But over time, your business has grown and evolved. And as a result, your terms of trade no longer fit your current business model. This is another thing to consider because if your terms of trade don't fit your current business model, again, you might as well not have them. Exactly. And it That's happens, it. guys. You know, business changes. You got to make sure that you do cover that stuff off. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that leads us to our third part of the process, and that is due diligence. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to, I don't know if I can say that or not. I'm going to say something that may slightly annoy a few of you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a better term for us. <laughs> Trade references are a complete and total waste of time. If you are doing them, don't bother doing them. As, as you saw in our little impromptu play, I'm the customer. I'm going to give you two random mobile numbers of people that you also don't know who are going to vouch for me and say that I'm going to pay my bills. Come on, we're all smarter than that. We know we can do better than that. Trade references, absolutely no point in doing them because almost invariably you'll find the trade references that you go to do, you call them up. And again, I'm going to do a little one man play here. You're going to call them up and you get this. Oh yeah, they're the greatest customer ever. They pay their bills on time. They're such <laughs> great payers. They pay their invoice before I even generate it. I don't even send them the invoice. It's already paid. <laughs> I, send them an invoice. I know it's in the bank account. They're the best customers ever. You need to take them on. Yep. Yeah, come on, really. The <laughs> fact of the matter is nobody is going to give you the trade references that you actually want to hear from. The trade references you want to know about are the people that they didn't pay. Now, let's just think about that for a second. I'm applying for credit with another business. Will I give you the businesses or just my friends and family that I'm going to, tell, I'm going to say to tell you that I pay on time? Or is that other business that's very similar to yours that I had a big problem with and I decided not to pay? Yeah. Mm, don't think I'm going to give you them. That's not going to do me any favors. That's the big problem. Everyone out there is self-serving. Relying on trade references is, again, gambling. It's not good enough. You can do better. We can do better. Let's make that better. Credit checks are not just for banks. <clears throat> Something that I hear all too often from potential clients of ours is, you know, we're too small to do a credit check. We're, we're too small to have this sort of process. We, we don't need to go through this sort of trouble. <clears throat> the reality is a credit check is just you looking at the history of the entity that you're looking at. Okay. A credit check is not the be all and end all of the process. In yeah. fact, all too often, a credit check is not actually going to reflect the current position that that company is in or that business is in. But a credit check can be as easy as just clicking a button, okay? If you've got your system and your process set up correctly, it's a very easy thing to go through. Now, if you don't, if you're using, I don't know, a company, we won't mention any names. but not let's mentioning just, names, no. <laughs> we won't mention any names, but let's just say if you're watching this, you'll know who I'm talking about. Now, if you have to log into their page and manually enter the information that you hope is right because you haven't actually got the identification part of the process right, you may or may not actually get a credit report. If you do get a credit report, it takes a while to get. You get it, you download it, and then you're left to your own devices to read and interpret it. Yeah. Now, as Linda rightly said earlier on, you may not have experience in the credit process. So looking at a credit check could be like reading a foreign language. <clears throat> now, that's a bit of an issue. If you're relying on a credit check and you're not sure how to read it, it's not really going to be of any value to you. This is where, again, having the right system in place allows you to get some assistance in reading that. Now, if you know how to read a credit check and you're looking at it, it can give you a lot of valuable information. For example, it can tell you if a business has got defaults, which means that someone has not been paid and they've taken action against your potential customer. It can tell you if there's been court action taken against them as well, which means that someone's gone beyond that and actually taken legal action in a court to get a judgment against that particular entity. <clears throat> it can also tell you their overall credit score. Now, depending on the report that you're getting, the credit score can tell you things like the risk factor based on how long they've been running, if they're GST registered, and a whole bunch of other factors. But the reality is credit checks are not just for banks. Okay, you are issuing credit as well. You deserve to do credit checks. It's something that you should be looking into. There are plenty of different uh, ways of doing that. There are several companies that offer it. <clears throat> and obviously those companies also integrate into the bulletproof solution, which we're going to go through at the end. Now, due diligence actually started at the beginning of the process when you checked the validity of the information your customer provided you. Okay. To put that into perspective, let's just say that bulletproof my business was your customer. Okay. You might add in your accounting system, 
bulletproof and send an invoice off to that. Now, there's a very good chance if I've actually purchased the service, I might pay the invoice. But because you haven't gotten the name correct, because the legal name is actually mm-hmm. bulletproof my business, PTYLTD, I'm under no obligation to do so. Okay, neither is your customer. And that's the big problem. If you don't go through the step at the beginning, then the second step falls over and the third step can't even happen. So that due diligence process starts right back at the beginning. And by doing it properly, by knowing the ABN, the ACN, if it applies, by knowing the company structure and the rest of it, you've got everything you need to create a valid invoice. And that's really important because if you don't create a valid invoice and you put the wrong name on there, whatever credit term you've actually allocated to them, if you have to change and reissue the invoice, that credit term restarts. Okay, so if they wait until day 30 of a 30 day term to tell you I'm not paying this because the invoice name is wrong. You have to reissue the invoice to the correct name. They can wait another 30 days. It's a quick way for them to buy themselves 30 days of free credit. Mm. And it's perfectly legal for them to do so. Maybe not ethical, but perfectly legal. Yeah. <clears throat> now there is a new form of due diligence being pioneered by certain fintechs like perhaps the one talking to you at the moment, which is a form of live credit check. Okay. Now you would have seen this in a lot of businesses at the moment. Some of the, um, some of the after pays and zip pays and that sort of thing, they're using something similar. Basically it's a way to peer into the current financial situation, which is far more relevant than the previous. So any of the short term money lenders for businesses, are actually using this process where they will log into your accounting system directly. They will look at your financials and they will ascertain from that what your credit risk is. Now that's a new way of doing a credit check. It's far more effective. It's much more accurate. And by doing that, it gives you a snapshot of right now. Okay. Because that's the other problem with a credit check. A credit check shows you the past, but a bad mark on there could stay on there for seven years, two years down the track, the business could be booming. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is there is no issue, but by the credit check, you could be losing a customer from it. So this new form of due diligence is basically the ability to peer into the books live. Now, obviously this is not you personally opening up their books, going into zero or mile or whatever it is and reading their balance, you know, reading their balance sheet and their profit and loss and saying, "Hmm, I think that's okay. This is all driven by software. Okay. So basically your system will look into their system and it will come back to you and say yes or no. And it's really that simple. Now that's where we are going. That's where due diligence is going. Due diligence is becoming something that is almost a completely automated process. And because of the pioneering efforts of these fintechs, it's making it available for businesses like you to be able to peer into the books and get a much more accurate snapshot without needing to know what it is you're looking at. At the end of the day, you're not all accountants. You don't know how to read the information that you're getting accurately enough to be able to ascertain the risk for it. You know for your own business because you know your business, but every business is set up differently. This is what allows you to have that interaction and to really have that safety net of knowing that a company is uh, is, um, credit worthy. Now, to go beyond that, the next level of this check is actually even further. It's when you've got enough critical mass within, the, within these systems, you'll be able to see if, if they're paying your competition live or not. You won't actually be able to see it by saying, hey, this is my competition name and that's when they're paid. But the systems will start to know your type of business, will know who your competition is, and it will be able to tell you this is a higher risk because they haven't paid your competition on time. Yeah. Now, that's where this technology is going. And it means that it will be a lot more difficult to deceive a business into issuing credit. And it also means that credit checks over time are becoming entirely redundant as well. Credit checks are going the way of trade references. Mm -hmm. Now that leads us to the fourth part of the process and that is setting credit terms. And this is another step that all too often gets skipped. Okay. Quite often we'll have a, um, we'll have a process that's a lot shorter. We'll identify by maybe looking at the ADR. We'll see the information is valid. We'll enter the information in our accounting system and we'll put them on seven days within yep. our accounting system, but nothing gets sent to the customer. There's no notification process. Now, how you decide the credit terms that you offer, ultimately it is a personal choice. It's what you're willing to risk in terms of uh, how long you are going to get paid and how much money you're going to lend that business. This process is where you define when your customer has to pay you. In other words, the credit terms, it would be at seven days, 30 days, COD, 30 days in a month, whatever combination it might be. 
This is also where you define how much you're willing to lend your customer, whether you set a credit limit or not. Now, yeah. quite often for service-based businesses, a credit limit is not something you would even consider. But if you're a product-based business, that's a physical amount of tangible risk you're carrying. So it is something that you would actually set. The reason this step is so critical is because if you don't notify your customer of what the credit terms are that you have accepted them on, they can just define their own. Which is why quite often on invoices where it says seven days, they're paying at 30 or 45 or whenever the hell they feel like it because you have not set credit terms as a formal part of the process. <clears throat> now, typically what you would do for this is you would write up an email and on that email you would say, congratulations, we've approved you for a credit account. We're putting you on 30 days. Your credit limit is $5,000. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you go to the bank and you apply for a credit card or if you go to the bank and apply for a personal loan or a business loan or whatever form of finance, at the end of that process, you are always going to get that letter of confirmation saying, hey, congratulations, this is how much credit you've got, this is what your payment terms are, this is your interest rate. You are lending money. It is not acceptable for you to do any less than that for your own business as well. And by doing this, this actually sets the expectation with your customer at the beginning of the process as to what you're actually expecting and when you want to get paid. So it's an absolutely critical step. And again, it's one that all too often just gets skipped because it's seen as a formality that's not always needed. The reality is it's absolutely needed. Now, the final stage in the credit process is, re is registration. We're going to talk about a few concepts here that you may not have heard of before, so bear with me. <laughs> There'll be a little bit of technical jargon, but I've had a bit of practice at translating that to normal English for the rest of us. So oh, good. <laughs> That'll be good. So basically, registration, what we're talking about here is the PPSA, the Personal Property Securities Act of 2012. And this was an act that has probably had as much impact as GST had when that was introduced. It changes everything that we thought we knew about money, about how we get paid, what happens to that money when we've been paid, and also the whole concept of title. Now, this has been in place since 2012, so it's by no means new. It's been around for over six years. Yeah. We were the last first world country not to actually have this legislation in place. To give you an idea, when this came in in 2012, New Zealand had already had this for 15 years. We were so far behind. America and Canada had had it for about 20 years at that point. We were just decades behind. Now, the reason this is so important is because the level of education and information out there on this subject is sorely lacking. I'd be willing to bet that out of 100 of you that are watching this, maybe one of you have heard of this. And I'd be willing to bet that out of 100 of you that have heard of it, maybe one of you have done something about it. Yeah. Okay? And in the five and a half years that I've been running Bulletproof, I have come across a grand total of one, one business that was doing this correctly. Now, I want to emphasize, this is not your fault. This is something that a lot of the time, we're just, we're blissfully unaware of it. And because the name of it is actually quite insidious, it's the Personal Property Securities Act. It doesn't sound like it actually applies to businesses. So if you were to see it mentioned in the news, you'd probably gloss over it because we run a business. Personal property has nothing to do with us. Therein lies the danger of this act. Because of the way that it works, it changes everything to do with what happens when you've been paid, what happens if there's a liquidation you haven't been paid, and also the title of physical goods that you release. We're going to talk a little bit about title first because that's not really the subject of this. So we'll just touch on it and then move on from that. Basically, what the PPSA has done is it's relinquished any notion of title from common law. It doesn't exist anymore. So for all of you out there that are putting on your invoices, all goods are mine until they're paid for. We can come and collect them whenever we want. Absolutely untrue. You cannot collect them. You have no right to them. You have no title over them. The second they are released from your physical custody, that is you've given them off to the customer or the courier has picked them up or whatever the circumstance is, they are no longer yours you have no right of repossession for them because they're no longer yours. Title has become registration. So the only way to have title over goods is to create a registration over those goods. That's the subject of another video. That's all I'm going to say on that. How That's going to be a huge one in itself. I think we should probably do a separate video on that because that, yeah, that requires absolutely. a lot of explanation. But if you want more information, have a look at the ppsr.gov.au website. Have a look at business resources and videos. It explains it briefly in there for the title side of it. What is completely missing from that is how it affects the money side of the business. Now, we're talking about liquidation here. 
okay, completely changes everything we thought we knew about liquidation. All too often, people to speak to us think that in a liquidation, the liquidator and the ATO are the only ones who get paid and everyone else misses out. This couldn't be further from the truth. In the 16-17 financial year, 92% of unsecured creditors got zero cents in the dollar. That is, they got nothing on what they were owed from a company that went into liquidation. Okay. Now, the PPSA has dramatically changed where, how you secure yourself to stop that from actually happening. So as it stands right now, if you are an unsecured creditor, if you haven't gone through this registration process, you're actually carrying two distinct risks. The first of those risks is that the money that you have been paid any time in the last four years by a business is actually at risk. Okay. Specifically the last six months of what you've been paid. Like, okay. Let's put that into perspective. You've got a company that's paying you $5,000 a month now for whatever service you provide. Okay. Yep. Now, just a quick side note, marketers, if you're being paid for advertising spend and you're paying Google, Facebook or whatever directly, that is included in this figure, the total amount you're being paid. Yeah. If you are being paid $5,000 a month and your customer goes into liquidation, the risk that you're carrying is not the $5,000 that was at 30 days. It's not the $5,000 from the month before that they skipped. It's actually six months worth of that because the liquidators are going to go through that company and look at the previous four years of trade history. They're going to look at the last six months of what they spent with every single unsecured creditor, yourself included, and they can issue what's called voidable preference or clawback for that last six months worth of dollar value, which is $30,000 in a $5,000 a month case. Now, think about this for a second. You're going to have to give back the $30,000 that you were paid over that six months. You've usually got seven days to pay it. So it's pretty quick. Yeah. But that $30,000, it didn't come to you for free. It wasn't, you know, it's not a hundred percent margin. Let's be generous and say that that cost you half of that amount to generate. Okay. That $30,000 cost you at least $15,000 to generate, which means that you've given back the gross plus you've spent the net. So that means $45,000 risk immediately, plus the 5,000 that they already owe you and the one from the month before. So to put that into perspective, a $5,000 a month customer could be up to a $55,000 risk for you right now, okay? And that's true of any dollar amount. It doesn't really matter how much you've been paid monthly, average it out, have a look at it, and that's how you can calculate your risk. Wow. Now that is a huge impact on any business. And the reality is most of us do not know this, okay? Yeah. Registration, the PPSA, and using the PPSR, which is the government register, can prevent this from being a problem. Because if you're a secured creditor, you fail the first of the two tests the liquidator needs to satisfy. One, that you're an unsecured creditor. Obviously, if you're a secured creditor, you fail that. And two, that you're being paid. Okay, now obviously I'm simplifying this quite a bit. There's a lot more detail in this, but that's the crux of it. The risk that you're carrying for a $5,000 a month customer is at least 10 times that amount. Okay. Now on the other side of it, the money that you are owed, if your customer goes into liquidation, 92% don't get paid anything that they are owed because they're an unsecured credit. And then that is a huge problem. And the reason that that's such a problem is because as an unsecured creditor, you're sitting at the bottom of the heap when it comes to liquidation. There is an order of liquidation and I'm gonna very briefly go over what that is. The order of liquidation, generally speaking, and I, I should have, I apologize, I should have put this in my slides. I missed this slide. So that's okay. the order of liquidation, you've got something called a PIMSI, which is at the top of the level. That's something that your finance companies will take out of your car, your photocopiers, whatever equipment you've, you've got financed, We'll have a PIMSI over it. Those PIMSI items will be removed from liquidation before that gets processed. After that, the next level of security down is the bank. Now, it's important that the banks are secured because if the banks can't secure themselves, they can't lend any money, the whole economy grinds to a halt. That's a pretty big problem. However, where it has changed and where you need to be aware of it, directly underneath the bank, there's another type of registration you can create. We call it a GSI, or General Security Interest. Basically what that is, is your way of becoming a secured creditor and creating that registration against your customer to say that they owe you money. Okay. Now, if you have that type of registration set up correctly at the right time with the right terms, if your process works, if your customer goes into liquidation, you will be paid everything you are owed before the liquidator can get a cent. Now, the reason for that is the liquidator is the pivot point. The liquidator, everyone above them is secured. Everyone below them is unsecured. 
they have to pay everybody above them in full before they can get a cent. The way that they do that, if the money has run out, which inevitably it has in liquidation, is they draw it up from underneath. Yeah. So the first target of a liquidator is usually everyone's favorite government department, the ATO. The ATO is the first to get one of those clawbacks and they will just give the money back because the government cannot actually be a secured creditor in this context. Now, once they've given the money back, that might get rid of the first few. There are still more that need to be paid above the liquidator. That's when they start taking money back off the unsecured creditors. And that is the significant risk, obviously, of being an unsecured creditor. The money that you've already been paid for the service, the job, the product that you've supplied is not actually yours, free and clear, for four years after you've been paid, which is pretty significant and obviously not good. Now, that's I why see many of us running away doing some research talk, well, talking to our accounts divisions going are we covered for this <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't be surprised if you are and look if your accounts department is not sure tell them to contact the looker and we'll give you a hand but just even guys you know think about it we're coaches in this specially and go, even going back to that credit point before that um, about putting a credit limit in it i think as coaches we we forget that that you know it is still our time so yes. I would be putting a limit and I do have a limit with, our, with my clients on how much they can get to before stop service comes into place. Yeah. Um, but I think we need to do that too. I think we need to actually put a proper credit limit in with our, with our clients on Absolutely. a consulting level to make sure that we don't, you know, protect it. You can't get your time back. As I've said, most coaches and clients, you can't get your time back. You can't take it back. And specifically on coaches, mentors, marketing yep. people, you all tend to be quite caring personalities, okay? You tend to give a lot and it wouldn't be uncommon and not that I'm pointing any fingers at a fellow presenter, but it wouldn't be uncommon for someone to come to you and say, look, I really need your help yep. and this is the problem that I've got. I, I need your help and, you know, for you to take that extra time because you're a caring person to take that extra time and try and help them. But the reality is you're putting your own business and your own livelihood at risk by doing that. Exactly. You know, I'm not saying change your personality, all of you at all. I'm saying no, but it is it is something in particular in that industry that we all fall into. You know, you get the person who goes, "I just need this little bit of help now." Yes, yes, and it's something that. And look, we've got a lot of marketers as clients as well. The reality is, we become the process for you, so that this doesn't become a problem for you. Yeah, they're your choices. You can either have the ideal credit process or the ideal credit problem. It's yeah, exactly. Now, the next thing that we're going to, I'd actually like to show you how we at Bulletproof solve this problem. Yep, yeah, this sounds good to me. <laughs> that bit there. So just give me a second as I change windows. Now, Linda and Clive have very generously set up a demonstration account on our system using their Oh, account. that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to show Clive how to use this properly later? <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Chase him up. I won't tell him just to watch the webinar because I've already done it once. That'd be too cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he's still watching with us. He is, he is actually so, Clive, you know. <laughs> okay, Clive, make sure you're paying attention right now. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to have more questions for you than what you'll get here. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. So look, th this is our implementation of the ideal credit process. Basically, we've taken all the steps that used to be difficult and we've made it so easy that there is no longer an excuse not to follow the ideal credit process. Yeah. Okay. All we need to do is add, we're going to add a commercial customer. In this case, we're going to add Bulletproof, but just to show you the power of the, this search, we're just going to do a quick search for Subway. And as you can see here, it brings up a lot of results. Uh, and okay. of course, how many people would invoice Subway? Well, and I know, yeah, lots, lots will invoice Subway, not thinking that there's a trust or a franchisee behind the company. Absolutely. In fact, take Subway Plainland. Yeah, there's my blindness coming in. I can't see. I think I said, I think it's Plainland. Yeah, Plainland. Yep, it's Plainland. Take Subway Plainland. Okay, Subway Plainland and all the other subways that are attached to it have a trust behind it. So if you want to form a, a legitimate agreement with them, a contract, you need to actually send it to the trustee the trust. for that trust, not to just Subway, whichever it might be. Now, that's where the identification process is so important. So in this case, and I can't see what I'm typing. So You've got it. You've got Bulletproof in there. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So when we do a search for Bulletproof, the first result, and obviously the most important, is Bulletproof My Business. <laughs> <laughs> you did rig and that at all. <laughs> and this actually illustrates exactly what I'm talking about. 
bulletproof as a word is not enough. If you were to have us as a customer and you invoice bulletproof, yes, we may pay you, but that's not enough. So what we do is we go ahead and select this. And you can see now we know it's an Australian private company. We know where it's based. We know it's in New South Wales in 2000, which is Sydney. And we can also see that it was GST registered from a date that I can't read. So whatever, whatever that says. 20th there. of June, 2013. That sounds right. <laughs> Good, I'm glad your facts are right. <laughs> now, in here, we're going to enter the contact details. Now, just so that you know, you only need to actually enter an email address at this point. It doesn't really matter what email address you enter in because this is a demonstration account, but you would enter your customer's email address yeah. and you would enter your customer's name. Okay, and then we won't worry about a mobile number for now. So at this then, point, Cameron, do we have to have a director or do we just have to have it a contact inside that company? It, it doesn't have to be a director. It can be anyone who's authorized within a company, but ideally okay. you want a director. That's the yep. person you'd want to be signing off on it. And then when it comes to sending a form, you've got two different types. You've got a terms of trade or a credit application. Now, which one you send of those really just comes down to your business. From a legal standpoint, they're identical. The terms yep. of trade behind them are identical. They will protect you just the same. So for this one, we're gonna send off a terms of trade. And you can see there now, we have gone through, we've identified, we've gone through the terms process. We're now just waiting to finalize the terms while that customer signs that terms of trade. Now, in this case, an email has been sent off to the customer. We're not gonna go through that. We're gonna take a shortcut. Yep. And there you go. So obviously this hasn't been set up completely because it's a demo account. There'd be your logo here normally. Ah, oh, pretty brandy. Okay, so we go and we tick a box and we click a button and it's gonna say, hang on a second, you haven't done this properly, you haven't put a mobile number in. Now, we go beyond just having plain forms. We validate the email address. So we don't just validate that it's a correctly structured email address, we actually talk to the mail server and make sure that that email address truly exists. That's okay, before you send it yep. off. We also validate the mobile phone number. So we go beyond just seeing if it's a valid format. We actually check to make sure it's connected. So if they try to give you a fake mobile number or a disconnected mobile number, the form will pick it up and actually stop them from doing that. That is cool. So in this case, I'm just gonna put my phone number in there and you'll see that I've added too many digits. Again, it picks it up. So let's remove that so it's properly done. Okay, and we accept the terms and conditions. Underneath there are the terms. As you can yep. see, that's disappeared. Now, oh, smiley face. The smiley face, it's done. Now we come back to the Vertiflow and we'll just refresh that and you'll see now we've gone beyond. Terms of trade have been signed. So we've now finished identification and yep. terms. Because this is a demonstration account, there's no credit checking limit, uh, credit check linked to it. So we can't do a credit check. So it's been skipped. Yep. Okay, which means we have skipped our due diligence. Key point there. If you are going to do your due diligence using a credit bureau, they can be linked to our system. We talk to them, pull in the credit report and teach you how to interpret it, okay? Mm -hmm. Now we're up to the set credit terms point. Now I'm flying blind here, so I'm doing this completely from memory. Seven let's days change that time. to 30 days, I think. Yep. And let's set a credit limit of $10,000, okay? Now, once you've done that, all you need to do is approve this application or if you're not happy with what you see, decline the application. Yep. Okay. And if you decline the application, that's the end of the credit process. It's finished at that point. Okay. Let's just say that you're being blind like I am and you click the wrong button. You can reconsider and change their credit terms to 30 days and however many zeros I put on that 10,000, I think. Yeah. 10, and then we approve this application. Okay. Now, this is really important because what's happened at this point is an email has been sent to your customer saying, Congratulations, you've been approved for credit. Your terms are 30 days. Your credit limit is $10,000. And it gives them that information. It also means you've got a track record of every single step along the yeah. way of what you've done. It's telling you that customer's story. We've already gone up to set credit terms. Now we're up to registration, okay? Now, registration is quite a difficult process, okay? Because, well, there's a lot of technical knowledge that's needed. So just, if you're watching at this point, I just want you to watch really carefully. We need to move the mouse and click a button. <laughs> which helps if you click the right button, which I can't see. <laughs> you were on the next button, but for yeah. demonstration, yep, click, click next. 
Now, at that point, that's the end of the credit process for you. As it says, the GSI registration is pending. Bulletproof will now step in and create that registration for you. You will get an email notification as soon as that's occurred. And that's the end of the process. Once you've gone through all of that, you can now safely invoice your customer because the credit process has been completed. Okay. Now, as you saw, that took only seconds to do. Yep. We're actually in the process at the moment of becoming a zero um, add-on at the, at the moment. So by January, I'm having one today. This is awesome. It's pretty exciting, which means that when you go through that credit process with Bulletproof, we'll push that information straight into zero for you. Yep. And, and this is the first time this has been publicly announced, so it's rather yeah. exciting. We have gotten confirmation from zero that we are going to be able to modify the way that zero behaves so we can enforce your credit terms. So if something happens to your customer, and they're no longer credit worthy. Their GST status changes, for example, or their ABN has been canceled or their legal entity has changed. We can stop zero from invoicing at that point to make sure that you're aware of it and that yep. you are protected. It be, means basically having bulletproof is like having an entire accounts department. I was going to say it's like saving a massive amount of time. Absolutely. And for those of you who have got an accounts department, having bulletproof in place doesn't replace them. It makes them better at doing their Effective, job and frees yeah. up their time. We're not my guys are gonna like this. Absolutely. Now, that's the credit process in its entirety. And by going through that ideal credit process in the beginning, by doing this properly, and it can be applied after you're dealing with someone as well. So for those who have got established customers, we're not ruling you out. This can happen for them as well. If you go through that process properly, you get paid on time in full. And it means you've got an enforceable process so that when you take this information to a debt collector, they're able to do their job so much better because the rules are defined. They've got consequences that they can enforce. They know that they've got the right entity. It makes your life easier. Bottom yeah. line, we're here to get you paid. That is awesome. Thank you. And that's yes. it. Coming, coming back from being a, a corporate troubleshooter and trying to get businesses out of that situation, I go, oh, that is great. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sure Cameron and Clive will be talking to you at some stage later on today and then talking to the accounts team because numbers is his thing. As I said, I'm a marketer. Just let me spend the money. Tell me how much money I've got to spend and I'm all good. <laughs> so we're, we're going to work on getting you some more money to spend then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and he can do that all you like. You know? But and seriously, guys, coming from a coach's and a consultant's point of view where we put money into place and we trust, and we do because we trust because we want to trust, where we trust people, it's not worth not clicking those buttons. Um, and that's what I'm going to say. It, you know, I've worked with large corporate organisations. I worked with organisations that used to hemorrhage money out each month. If we had this in place, we could have saved ourselves a hell of a lot more time in relation to those sorts of things. So I see some massive value, especially for those who trade. And just think about it. You know, when you're working with, with, in teams like I do, I've got, we've got wages that we pay. You know, yeah. we've got subcontracting fees that we pay. We've got um, costs of using services. You don't want anyone clawing back, back over the last four years. That's just ridiculous. One final note, guys. If you have any questions, and I'm sure that you will, feel uh, free to jump on the Bulletproof Facebook page. Reach out through there. Obviously, all your inquiries are completely anonymous. I'm happy to answer any questions that you've got. Um, I'll also be doing regular Facebook Lives on the Bulletproof page. Oh, we better go follow it, guys. Sorry? You better go follow it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's out there now. I have to do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll be hunting Cameron down about this time next week if there's no Facebook Live going, Cameron, you promised a Facebook Live. Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> well. Now, Cameron, um, one thing you haven't covered for us is how much is this for a business owner to look at? What, what is the deal? Because, you know, let's show people what they're looking at if they need to invest in this in their business. And this is an investment in your business, guys. It really is something you know, marketing and all the tools out there that I talk about being an investment, they are an investment, but this is a, this is protection. This is insurance. Absolutely. And I'm just going to share my window again. Our pricing right. is really straightforward. There are only three parts to it. Okay. And I want to make the distinction. Hey, look, there I am again. I want to make the distinction. We're going to talk about two different types of businesses. You've got businesses that deal with other businesses only. Yeah. And then you've got businesses that deal with consumers. That is mum and dad customers, residential, that sort of thing. Yep. So, to get Bulletproof set up, you're looking at $1,100 once. And in that, we will customize your terms for you. We'll configure credit management, get you set up, train you, import your existing customers if that applies. Basically, get you to the point where you're completely up and running and ready to go. Okay? 
Future proof terms is $55 monthly. What we do for that is we keep your terms of trade up to date. So if there's a change in the law and we need to change your terms of trade, you don't even have to think about it. It's already it's done. done. Okay, so you know that at any point, the agreement you send out from the Bulletproof system is going to be the most up-to-date that it possibly can be. And we go further than that. If there's a change that requires us to get another signature from your customers, we'll manage that process entirely for you. You don't have to lift a finger. Now, on top of that, that also includes an unlimited number of credit applications and terms of trade that you can send out to any of your customer types. So if you are a business to consumer, that's the end of your pricing that's it. It's really quite straightforward. Wow. If you're business to business, there's one other thing that you need to be aware of, and that is the registration and monitoring. Now, the registration, that PPSR registration, it's $11 upfront once, and then $1 per month per customer for monitoring. Now, we monitor things like notifiable events. So, for example, if your customer's postcode changes, if they move, if their legal yep. entity changes, they change their name, GST registration changes, and a whole bunch of other things, we are the only company in the country without exception that notifies you of these events within five minutes of them happening. Wow. Our closest competition is two days. We're five minutes. So it means that you are always with a finger on the pulse. You know exactly what's happening at any point in time. And it means that you can be the most agile and reactive because if someone changes their legal entity, if they change their company name, you don't want to find out about that in two days time. after. No, exactly not. Yeah, because they're not going to have to pay that invoice. You're going to have to change the invoice appropriately. Yep. We make sure that you are constantly protected. And for that reason, our pricing is really straightforward and really, really simple. So there's our pricing. Okay. That's basically how it works. Um, in terms of a special offer, I do have a special offer for Yay. anyone who watch this. Okay. Basically, if you are joining as a result of this webinar and you have to obviously let us know that you are joining as a result of the webinar, we will give you your first five registrations free of charge. Wow. That's pretty cool, guys. Okay. Well, Cameron, thanks for joining us. If anyone's got any questions, pop them into the chat bar, pop them into the, the Facebook live stream, or even comment them on the blog. We'll, I'll include in the replay links Cameron's Facebook page so that you can message him and have a chat with him from there. Guys, it is one of those particular things within business, and we'll have Cameron back later on next year to come back and talk different things with us. Um, but bear that in mind that we need to look at look after our businesses and this is insurance. Um, and even if you don't, you know, just even think of it from the point of view, if you don't have a credit division, that is amazing for you to be able to protect yourself for those of you who are doing your own invoicing. And I'm sure that this will be a conversation that will come up with our accounts team later on this week. Uh, <laughs> going, have a look at this. And I'll just make Clive talk to them because, you know, numbers are their thing, not mine. <laughs> I'm the first business owner to put my hands up in the air going, show me the report, tell me what the report's saying. Okay, yep, yep, can't see anything that I shouldn't see. I'm all happy with that. Um, and then I, you know, do the other stuff and get the receipts like I should do and all the good, good things that we do in business. So for those of you who don't know what's coming up next, oh my gosh, what a week ahead we have with us. Um, next week, we have Rob from Thinkific coming and joining us talking about creating value for our courses. So creating value for our students and making sure that they feel valued and engaged. And I know Cameron, I've already spoken to you about doing some online courses about what you do. So you need to be in that webinar next week. Um, and then our final webinar of the year is with me from me, Edgar, um, and we're talking about how to get time back in your world of social media and how to create engagement. So do more on social media with less time is what we are going to be talking about. Megan's last webinar actually booked out with us. So please, if you're looking at doing that one, make sure that you register. There's a hundred spots available in it, but then when we hit that level, um, we're going to be out there. And for those of you who are already using me, Edgar, like I am, there has been so many new features that I can't wait to pick Megan's brain on. How do I use them to get better use of my time as well? Um, because you know, now she's coming in. I won't go and find it out myself. I'll wait till she gets here and ask her questions instead. <laughs> um, so that is it for 2018. Then that is the end of our skills webinars. We will be taking a break after that because you know we want to see what family, children, husbands, wives, all of that, pe those people in the team look like for the month of January is our plan. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, random, random things that we want to see. Um, but if you have any interest in your skills webinar replays, or you're watching this in a replay over that period of time, then head to business 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 forward slash skills and you'll be able to catch up on all the skills webinars we ran this year in the replay library and there's lots and lots of learning for you there as well Cameron thanks for joining us once again it has My been pleasure. awesome to learn about how we can secure our credit process a little bit further 
Um, and I look forward to seeing you back next year when we share some more tips with everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.